Breast Cancer Symposium. I'm Megan Claire Chase, and I am SHARE's Breast Cancer Program Director and host of our BC Life podcast. Plus, I'm also a seven-year invasive lobular survivor. I'm going, um, let's see, before our presentation begins, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SHARE. We're a national nonprofit that supports educates and empowers anyone diagnosed with breast or gynecologic cancers and provides outreach to the general public about signs and symptoms because no one should have to face breast, ovarian, uterine, cervical, or metastatic breast cancer alone. So for more information about upcoming webinars, support groups, podcasts, and our helplines, please visit our website at sharecancersupport.org. Now, we have a few housekeeping reminders for you. All participants will be muted during the presentation. And as I mentioned earlier, the chat is enabled. So feel free to write comments and engage with each other uh, and make sure to select everyone uh, in the little drop down box when using the chat. Now, once our fabulous presenter, Dr. Shen, finishes presenting, We'll begin the Q&A discussion. Please submit any questions through the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Remember that Dr. Shen is unable to give specific medical advice, so please keep your questions general in nature. We also have closed captioning available. You can enable this feature by clicking on the live transcript, transcript button on the bottom of the screen and selecting the subtitle option. And this webinar is being recorded and we'll share that recording in, <clears throat> in a few weeks with all of the registrants and it will also be added to our website. So now, y'all, I would love to hand it on over to Dr. Shen to introduce herself. So Dr. Shen, the screen is yours. Great. Hi, everyone. It's um, afternoon where I am, so I'll say good afternoon. Uh, I'm Sherry Shen. I'm a breast cancer medical oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. I saw that some of you guys are joining us from New York, um, where I am, where it's freezing. Um, but it's lovely to meet with you all, and I'm so excited to um, share some recent updates and talk about the latest research. Um, I myself am a researcher. I study metabolic health in breast cancer, and I also lead clinical trials, particularly in the hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer space. I'm so happy to talk about that as well. So with that, um, let me pull up my slides. Megan, Claire, I'm going to get rid of yours if that's okay. You bet. Okay. Give me a second to put this in the right setting. Okay. Does this look okay? Perfect. Hopefully. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, as I said, really excited to join today. Um, thank you to Share Cancer for having me here today. I um, did one of these last year in June. Um, I did the ASCO update in the metastatic breast cancer setting. So I'm really thrilled to be here to share some early stage cancer updates from our San Antonio breast cancer meeting that happened in December of 2023. Um, and overall in the early stage setting, I would say that um, there tends to be less research in that space as compared to the metastatic setting that comes out of each of these meetings. There's a lot of clinical trials that go on in the metastatic space. And there are some in the early stage cancer space too, but these clinical trials typically take longer to conduct and read out because in the early stage setting, we're really trying to move the needle on recurrence rates, and that can take many, many years of follow-up um, to look for those recurrence events. So we tend to get a little bit less in the way of updates at each of our um, breast cancer meetings. So I'm going to try to give the major highlights and, and talk about those. But overall, I did want to keep this relatively short because I know there's a lot of questions, and I would love to leave plenty of time for questions and discussion. So um, at any point during this talk, um, if you think of anything you want to ask about or, or chat about, please do um, go ahead and type it into the chat box. Um, these are my disclosures. I receive funding to my institution to conduct clinical trials, but I myself don't take any payments from pharma. So the outline of um, what I'm going to talk about today are some updates on adding an immunotherapy specifically for 
I've abbreviated ER as an estrogen receptor, but also known as hormone receptor positive breast cancer. So the question really is, should we add immunotherapy to neoadjuvant chemotherapy? So I'll talk about two studies looking at that question. I'll talk about adjuvant, meaning post-surgery use of CDK4-6 inhibitors. This is also specific to hormone receptor positive breast cancer. So who is the right patient to get these drugs? And um, is it worth some of the side effects that these drugs come with? I'll talk a little bit about circulating tumor DNA. I think there's a lot of controversy in our field as to the right way and how to use this and a lot of ongoing research. So I'll talk about some recent updates um, and then put that into context of what we do with these types of data. And I'll give some surgery and radiation updates that came out of San Antonio as well. But again, we'll leave plenty of time for questions and discussion. So just to go over neoadjuvant chemotherapy in general, specifically who gets it and what is the point? So the goals of giving neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which means preoperative chemotherapy, so before breast cancer surgery, um, there are several reasons to do this. One is to downstage the tumor, meaning make the tumor smaller, and therefore make surgery easier on the surgeon to achieve clean margins, perhaps to do less extent of axillary surgery. Number two is to be able to see the response to ongoing treatment and if needed to escalate treatment after surgery, meaning that in some settings with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we get the entire tumor and at the time of surgery, there's nothing left. But in some cases, we don't and there still is some cancer left. So in those cases, we are able to escalate to give a different kind of therapy after surgery. So if we've given chemotherapy before surgery, we can look at that response and make a decision about how to appropriately treat post-surgery. And the third is really to eradicate micrometastatic disease. What that means is metastatic disease that's not able to be seen by the eye. So not detectable on a PET scan and really not meaningfully detectable by um, our latest blood-based technologies. But we know that for high-risk breast cancers, those cells exist, those seeds that circulate throughout the body in the bloodstream, which are not treated by surgery and radiation alone. So we give neoadjuvant chemotherapy upfront before surgery to eradicate that micrometastatic disease. So who gets neoadjuvant chemotherapy? It's different based on the subtype of breast cancer. So for estrogen receptor or hormone receptor positive breast cancer, we really give chemotherapy depending on operability, meaning depending on the size of the cancer and depending on if there are lymph nodes involved in certain populations, if the surgery feels that they can take the patient up front for surgery, we generally encourage that to be done. If the tumor is too big relative to the size of the breast, or if it's slightly too big to do a lumpectomy, it would require a mastectomy, or if it would require too much dissection of the axillary lymph nodes up front, that's where neoadjuvant chemotherapy is recommended. For HER2 positive and for triple negative breast cancers, we do neoadjuvant chemotherapy at an even smaller size or for any lymph nodes that are involved. These are two more aggressive subtypes of breast cancer, and we're going to be giving them, giving patients um, systemic therapy anyway. So it helps in these cases to give it before surgery for the reason I mentioned of seeing what the response was and being able to escalate appropriately post-surgery. So for both HER2 positive and triple negative breast cancers, we give neoadjuvant chemotherapy for tumors that are larger than two centimeters or if there's any lymph node involvement. So the data I'm going to present next are specific to hormone receptor positive breast cancer and looking at can we add immunotherapy to chemotherapy as part of this neoadjuvant pre-surgery treatment, and does that help? So what I'm going to show are the designs of these studies, and these are very busy slides, which I'm going to kind of walk us through. So this was Keynote 756, which was a study of pembrolizumab, which is a kind of immunotherapy, and neoadjuvant chemotherapy for estrogen receptor positive breast cancer or hormone receptor positive breast cancer. So patients needed to, in terms of the eligibility gray box here, have, again, at least a two centimeter tumor or some lymph nodes that were involved. And it had to be 
confirmed grade three, meaning a high grade tumor. And treatment naive just means they hadn't received any kind of treatment for their cancer. Patients were randomized. You can see that there were 1,278 patients in this study were randomized one to one to either the top arm here shown in this teal color, which was the addition of immunotherapy to a very standard chemotherapy backbone after which patients underwent surgery, and then the immunotherapy was continued for six months without any further chemo, and then endocrine therapy was added in, which is a standard part of treatment for hormone receptor positive breast cancer. On the other hand, half of the patients were randomized to the maroon arm, which was no immunotherapy, but still the same standard chemotherapy backbone. Then they went to surgery, and then um, they received placebo for six months in place of immunotherapy because this was the control arm. And then again, endocrine therapy up to 10 years. I'll talk about the results of this study um, in a second because I'm going to also show a very similar sister study. This study called Checkmate 7 FL looked at a different kind of immunotherapy called nivolumab. It's very, very similar in the way it works and then added that to neoadjuvant chemotherapy for a very, very similar, nearly identical patient population. So if we look at the left at the inclusion criteria, this was also estrogen receptor positive, also known as hormone receptor positive breast cancer. They also had to have a tumor size of at least two centimeters or positive lymph nodes, also had to be grade three or also known as high grade. Um, so these patients were then randomized one-to-one, -one, very similarly, Along the blue arm on top, this was the addition of immunotherapy to a very standard chemotherapy backbone versus the gray arm, which was placebo, um, in addition to that same chemotherapy backbone. So now I'll talk about the results of these two studies. The primary endpoint, meaning what the trials were really designed to show, was the rate of having gotten all the cancer with neoadjuvant treatment by the time of surgery, meaning the surgeon goes in there, does their surgery, but when the pathologist reviews that specimen slide by slide, there's actually no cancer left. I want to put this in context to say that in HER2 positive and in triple negative breast cancer, that is really the goal, is to get everything, also known as a pathologic complete response. That means on pathology, there's a complete response, there's no cancer left, because that is highly correlated to doing well long-term. If all the cancer is eradicated, it's very likely that all that micrometastatic circulating disease was all eradicated, and therefore recurrence rates are lowest for that group of patients. That is not necessarily the case in hormone receptor positive breast cancer because there's kind of two components to treatment. The patients who need that upfront chemotherapy get it, but remember that for these patients, they have hormonal-based or endocrine therapy on the back end post-surgery as well. And so getting everything, that rate of pathologic complete response has always been quite low in this disease type. And that's okay because we continue to give a different kind of treatment. And because these tumors aren't always very chemosensitive, they're also hormonally sensitive as well. So just wanted to put that into context. These are the results of those clinical trials. Keynote 756 is shown on the left. Checkmate 7FL is shown on the right. And what these two graphs are showing is that when immunotherapy is added in, which is the left sidebar of both of these graphs, there's a higher rate of that complete response, eradication of the entire cancer by the time of surgery. That's almost a quarter of patients when immunotherapy is added in, as opposed to 13 to 15% of patients when there's no immunotherapy added in. So the conclusions from these two big phase three studies was that adding immunotherapy definitely increases the pathologic complete response rate. But the open question is, does it decrease the risk of recurrence though? That's what really matters at the end of the day is does it move the needle there? And only one of those two phase three trials was designed to answer that question and it's too soon. We only have the complete response data from the time of surgery, but we haven't in this clinical trial followed patients out long enough to know if it moves the needle on the risk of recurrence. So we have to wait more data. Certainly this is really interesting, um, but immunotherapy is not coming to this particular set of patients anytime soon yet. We still need to look at that recurrence data um, before it can be fully evaluated and integrated into standard of care.
Okay, so moving on to, for the same group of hormone receptor positive breast cancer patients, what to do in the post-surgery setting. That's what adjuvant means is post-surgery. So um, CDK4-6 inhibitors are a class of drugs that were first developed for metastatic hormone receptor positive breast cancer, and they're currently FDA approved in the first line setting. So it's standard of care um, for most patients to get a CDK4-6 inhibitor as first line treatment for metastatic hormone receptor positive breast cancer. There's three that are currently FDA approved in that setting, palbocyclib, ribocyclib, and abemocyclib. The way these drugs work is they inhibit these proteins called CDK4 and 6, which are responsible for helping a cancer cell grow and divide. So if you stop that, if you inhibit those proteins, the cancer cells aren't able to grow and divide like normal. In 2021, we got an FDA approval for abemocyclib specifically, which is one of the three CDK4-6 inhibitors for early stage hormone receptor positive breast cancer in the post-surgery setting. That's because we got data from a, a very large phase three trial that compared adding abemocyclib to not adding abemocyclib to standard endocrine therapy, and abemocyclib decreased recurrence rates. So that's where the FDA approval came from. So what I want to share as an update from the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium was a very similar study called Natalie looking at a sister CDK4-6 inhibitor called ribocyclib. So again, abemocyclib is FDA approved. This is now the major study for ribocyclib. So I just wanted to show how this study was designed. If we look at the inclusion criteria in the gray box to the left, this was a little bit different from the abemocyclib study in that it included some patients with stage two disease, whereas the abemocyclib study mostly included patients with stage three disease. So it was a higher risk population. So Natalie with adjuvant ribocyclib included some stage two patients, but with some caveats, um, which are pretty complicated, but it depended on the grade of their tumor or their oncotype risk score or whether they had lymph nodes involved. And patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either the top blue arms, which is where they got an aromatase inhibitor like letrozole or anastrozole plus ribocyclib, or just the aromatase inhibitor alone, which is the gray arm. They gave ribocyclib at a dose of 400 milligrams, which is lower than what we give in the metastatic setting, and patients got that for three years. And the primary endpoint is this endpoint called invasive disease-free survival, which looks at breast cancer recurrence in the same breast, in the opposite breast, and far away, meaning stage four disease. And what this study found was that at the three-year time point from starting to take ribocyclib, that there so far has been a 3% difference between the study arms in terms of recurrence of any kind. And this was statistically significant. And so this means that the trial met its primary endpoint. This graph is just to show the difference between these two CDK4-6 inhibitors with respect to who could be eligible for this kind of treatment. So Abemocyclib is on the right. I mentioned that it's mostly for stage three patients. So that's why kind of if you look at the staging on the left, it goes from one, two, three. It's mostly stage three patients that are in green because they these are the patients who were included. Everyone had to have at least one positive lymph node to be able to get abemocyclib. And then some people in the stage two category had to have some additional criteria in order to be occluded. But what this is really trying to show you is that with the Natalie study for ribocyclib, this study included a lot more patients that would not have been eligible for a bemocyclib. That's what's shown in the red box here with what's green in the ribocyclib column. There's just all these patients who had stage two disease who were included and therefore are would be eligible to get ribocyclib. But I think what we're still um, kind of struggling with and trying to hear from this clinical trial is in this stage two group, is there really benefit? We saw additional data at San Antonio that it's really the patients with no lymph node involvement that got the most benefit from ribocyclin. And the patients who didn't have any lymph nodes involved got a lot less benefit. So that difference between those two lines that I showed on the prior graph was much, much smaller in patients with stage two who didn't have any lymph nodes involved. So I think we really still have to think about, is that small amount of benefit worth the risk?
there's definitely side effects, which I'm going to share on the next slide. That drug is given for three years, and there's a lot of financial toxicity, both to patients and to our health system as well, because these are very, very expensive drugs that we're giving for three years. And it takes treating around 30 to 50 patients to prevent one single metastatic event in one of the patients. So I think that's still something that we're really thinking about. And um, ultimately, it's up to the FDA to review all these data and decide in which patient population to approve ribocyclib eventually. Just to show the different side effects of these two drugs, ribocyclib is on the left, abemocyclib is on the right. Both of these drugs cause a lot of count suppression. That's what neutropenia is. It's decrease in the level of white blood cells. They can cause liver toxicity. They cause nausea, fatigue. Abemocyclib really causes a ton of diarrhea. Over 80% of patients get diarrhea. Um, QTC prolongation happens in ribocyclib. What that means is an abnormal measure of electricity in the heart, which can be dangerous when there are other medications that do that given simultaneously. Both can cause some low levels of lung toxicity and both can cause clot risk as well. So, you know, like I mentioned, I think we still have to think about if there's a benefit to risk ratio here and who is the right patient. We need to make sure we select um, the patients who are going to truly get benefit from this and don't um, you know, give this to patients who are getting a very small amount of benefit, but for three years of side effects and toxicity. So that still also remains to be seen. Okay, last um, two slides that I wanted to go through. Oh, sorry. Let me go through this one first. This is the conclusions, which I, I think I already mostly mentioned. Um, so abemocyclib is FDA approved. This Natalie trial of ribocyclib included those stage two patients. And these data are overall promising, but exactly who is going to get that benefit is still unclear. So some of the questions that we still in our field really have unanswered are, um, does everyone who met those inclusion criteria like those stage two patients really need these drugs? How can we really better select the patients who would benefit the most and do those benefits warrant the toxicities, okay? Okay, now last two slides. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about ctDNA all on one slide. What ctDNA is, is it's a blood-based test that can detect circulating tumor DNA, meaning tumor cells that are in the bloodstream that can rupture and release some of their DNA. We, can, we have um, new technologies that help us detect the, the, that DNA. It's a little bit similar to um, like women in pregnancy who get fetal DNA tests. That's just a blood test. It's a similar technology. I think one thing we're really struggling with in our, in our um, clinical practice, though, is that we know that ctDNA, again, that DNA from cancer cells that's detected in the bloodstream, is prognostic. It has something to tell us about each patient's individual prognosis. But it's not necessarily, we're not necessarily ready yet to use these data to inform how we change our clinical practice. And I'll explain a little bit more about what that means. So how can we go from the research to the clinic? Starting with just the research updates themselves, um, some of the data that we heard from San Antonio, I'll start with in the neoadjuvant setting, so related to treatment that's given before surgery. Most patients who need to get that neoadjuvant chemotherapy, again, these are patients with higher risk tumor subtypes like HER2 positive or triple negative, or they have larger tumors, they have lymph node involvement. Most patients have circulating tumor DNA detectable in the blood before they start treatment. And that baseline detection rate is highest in triple negative breast cancers. If during midway through neoadjuvant chemotherapy or at the end of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, if ctDNA is not cleared out from the bloodstream, meaning it's still detectable, that is prognostic of recurrence, meaning that's associated with a higher risk of recurrence if ctDNA remains detectable, either midway or at the end. In the post-surgery setting, ctDNA can be detected, um, we learned in one of these studies, up to two years before recurrence. But the average amount of lead time is a few months before a true recurrence is detected. And recurrence is always detected and defined based on a scan, like being able to physically see a tumor somewhere on a scan. And similar to the neoadjuvant setting, being able to detect any amount of ctDNA after completion of chemo 
or for patients with hormone receptor positive disease after completion of that CDK4-6 inhibitor is worrisome for recurrence. In patients um, who are high risk estrogen receptor positive or hormone receptor positive, um, meaning lymph node involved or larger tumors, the detection rate at nine years from the time of surgery is almost 10% of patients. And we also know or have learned that the more you screen, like the more blood draws that you do for this, that increases the detection rates. That's because each one test itself is not 100% able to detect any ctDNA. So therefore, if you repeat it, you're more likely to catch it if something is actually there. But we also learned from some of these studies that even in patients where there's persistently nothing detected each time, recurrences still happen in those patients. So I think, you know, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of interest in ctDNA that comes out of each meeting that we have, but something we're really still struggling with as a field is, is it really clinically useful? And this is somewhere where I would also love to hear from you guys and, and what your thoughts are. Basically, um, what I've shown here and what we already know in the field of, of using ctDNA is that after treatment, seeing ctDNA there is really worrisome. Those patients have a higher chance of recurrence. But the real question is, what do we do with that data? If we've detected ctDNA, we know that's more worrisome for recurrence, but we don't have clinical trials yet telling us that, oh, if we should escalate our therapy this way or change our therapy that way, does that make a difference? Or was it just that those patients unfortunately had bad disease and that recurrence was just going to happen? So I feel like it gives a lot of information and prognostic information without really telling us what to physically do about that information and how we can change our practice or give different medications. We also don't know the exact right time points after surgery to check. Like if you check too early and there's nothing detected, but some patients still get recurrences. Um, should you check at the end of five or 10 years, et cetera, of hormonal-based therapy, or should you check in the middle somewhere? These are all still questions that we're dealing with as a field. So I feel like we really generate more questions than we do answers. Um, and we're not really quite ready to be using ctDNA regularly in the clinic just yet. So a lot more to come on that topic. And then really quick, um, surgery and radiation updates. This is my last slide. And um, I put the disclaimer here that I'm a medical oncologist. I don't give radiation. I don't do surgery. So these data are very interesting, um, but definitely worth talking with your surgeon or, or radiation oncologist about if you're interested in specifically. We got data from the very large Senomac trial of over 2,000 patients, where this was for patients who had cancer detected in one or two of their sentinel lymph nodes when they went for surgery. And the question was, should those patients go for a complete axillary lymph node dissection, meaning removal of a lot more lymph nodes, or are they going to be just fine? We just detected those one or two. And this trial confirmed that those who did a full axillary lymph node dissection didn't actually have significantly lower recurrence rates. So it does seem like axillary lymph node dissection can be safely avoided if there's one or two positive nodes. If there's more than that, we're still recommending axillary lymph node detect, um, dissection. And this Senomac trial just confirmed another very large trial called ECOZOG Z11, and they both showed the same results. So that was nice to see that we can avoid giving doing more surgery in some of these patients, because I think as many of you know, that extensive of an axillary surgery can cause a lot of issues afterward with lymphedema. This um, next study, which you can see is just like a lot of letters and a lot of numbers. This was uh, trying to answer the question of if we're giving pre surgery chemotherapy, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and we clear out the lymph nodes, meaning the lymph nodes have no more cancer left in them, do those patients still need specific radiation to that lymph node armpit area as well? And what this study found was that it seemed like giving radiation to that area in patients who completely cleared out those lymph nodes did not change the recurrence risk. So maybe we can avoid giving axillary radiation in those cases. But this was a preliminary analysis of that trial. Um, the data were not final. And then lastly, from the IDEA study, this was a very specific study for postmenopausal women from ages 50 to 69 with very small tumors, so less than two centimeters, with a low oncotype score. This was estrogen receptor positive, also known as hormone receptor positive. Could they avoid radiation completely 
even if they just underwent lumpectomy. And what they found was that the recurrence rates were really low in this group without any radiation. So hopefully patients with these really small tumors who are really low risk can maybe stop getting radiation entirely. Um, but this wasn't a randomized controlled trial. It was just a single arm trial. So there is a large randomized control trial comparing radiation versus no radiation in this specific population is, is ongoing. But I think what this is really to illustrate is that we as a field are really trying to be more precise in the treatments that we give to patients, trying to be thoughtful in who we are selecting for these treatments that are not benign, that have a lot of side effects. So we're really learning to de-escalate, but we need to make sure it's safe to do so through these big randomized clinical trials um, um, to make sure that it's okay to give lesser therapy without causing an increase in recurrence. So we have to select the right patient population and test that de-escalation strategy, but it is very much um, on our mind to spare patients' toxicity as much as possible. So I will end there um, and happy to take any questions. Thanks everyone for listening. Well, Dr. Shen, first of all, thank you so, so much for um, presenting all of that research to us today. And there's always, you know, that fear of recurrence and it can just feel frustrating to, to not, um, you know, get some really solid um, answers on, on what we can do. And so we did get a lot of questions submitted with our registration and we do have a few that have been submitted live. So I'm just going to get to it. All Great. right. All right. So what percentage of women, or are you able to tell us what percentage of women end up becoming metastatic or have a recurrence after an early stage breast cancer diagnosis? This is a really tough question to answer for two reasons. One is that it really depends on the kind of breast cancer and very specific clinical features. So kind of to illustrate that, for example, recurrence rates are higher for triple negative breast cancers than they are for hormone receptor positive breast cancers. Um, and it also depends on the extent of disease. So patients who have a lot more cancer, meaning bigger tumors or a lot more lymph nodes involved, have higher recurrence rates than people who have really little tumors that look very um, organized under the microscope. Those are lower risk tumors and associated with a lower risk of recurrence. So it's really hard to tell um, across subtypes and across different kinds of patients with different kinds of tumors. That's one reason. The second reason is that we're always getting better therapies. So what may have been like kind of the generally acknowledged recurrence rate last year is different because we keep developing these clinical trials that are moving the needle and decreasing that recurrence rate. So some data that I didn't share, for example, at least in slide form, but I'll share now. So for the HER2 positive space, um, the Catherine clinical trial tested using Cadzyla, which is an antibody drug conjugate after surgery, as opposed to just trastuzumab alone in patients in whom we didn't get everything, meaning there's still some cancer left after pre-surgery um, chemotherapy. And it they shared a very long-term final update from that clinical trial, given Cadsila has been standard of care in this case for uh, many years now, actually. And they shared that still after many, many years, the final analysis really showed a significant benefit in reducing those recurrence rates by giving Cadsila. Similarly, in the triple negative breast cancer space, um, as of a few years ago, we're now giving this very intensive regimen called Keynote 522, which is four chemos and one immunotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting for triple negative breast cancer. And we heard some updates at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium that patients who got immunotherapy, they really do get a slightly higher rate of pathologic complete response that was statistically significant. And they ultimately have a lower recurrence rate as well as have as a result of having received that immunotherapy. And so with all these changes, it gets hard to estimate recurrence risk because the recurrence risk for a patient, you know, a couple years ago before these trials showed the new standard of care is different from now having received these drugs as well because they're kind of also changing that recurrence rate. So it's it's really, really hard to say on an individual level. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But the recurrence risk really... I mean, we're trying to cure and we're trying to get better at curing all of our patients with early stage breast cancer, but unfortunately some do recur. And that kind of ranges up to based on 
the anatomy and like I said, these different subtypes, that sort of thing can be up to 20 to 30% of the high risk patients are still recurring. You know, I mean, but it's, it's, a, but it's really yeah. very hard to estimate. Right. I mean, person. it's another reminder, you know, every body is, is different, right? right. Um, and the fact that you just mentioned this term again, we, we, we did get a question. Can you explain again, what complete pathologic response is and, and how, how is that decided? Is that like through surgery, biopsy, scans, what? Yeah, absolutely. Complete pathologic response is a very specific term used when chemotherapy or just treatment in general, like um, IV treatments, I mean, chemotherapy plus minus immunotherapy or anti-HER2 therapy is given before surgery. So that's a very specific subset of patients who have high risk disease where we need to give them some chemo before they go to surgery. Then at the time of surgery, everybody needs to get surgery no matter what. At the time of surgery, the pathologist looks through that entire area that the surgeon removed. And if there's no cancer left, meaning the pre-treat, pre-surgery chemotherapy got everything, that's what's called a pathologic complete response. So the cancer completely responded as assessed on pathology. So there's no cancer cells left. If there's even a little bit of cancer left that the pathologist sees, that's called not a complete pathologic response because it's not a complete response, right? There's still something. It was a partial response. And those are the scenarios where we know to escalate or change something that we're doing post-surgery because the tumor is aggressive enough that it didn't fully respond to chemo. So we have to be aggressive and give it something different essentially. Does that make sense? You know, so basically, um, because I've, I've heard, you know, from some other patients where they're like, my oncologist never told me I would need radiation. Like, what do you mean? And then they have the surgery. And so actually that really does make sense of, well, you know, once we got in there, we realized that, you know, you didn't have a complete pathologic response. Therefore now we feel we need to add, you know, A, B, C, and D treatment. So I think that might, that might help us a little bit to better understand when when we're hearing that we need something else and we and we aren't fully like mentally prepared for that because we're like, aren't we done now? So I think that's helpful. I think that's such a good point and something that's a really good reminder to all of us as oncologists. I think having that kind of treatment roadmap in your mind is so important and it's very different based on the kind of breast cancer. Some people are getting a whole year of treatment. Some people get chemo and then surgery and then it stops, but then they have to take pills and some people get radiation and some people don't. And so it's a good reminder to us to help patients understand from the beginning kind of what to expect at every step and not really feel like there's a sudden surprise based on what happened based on surgery. Right. 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 My goodness. Okay. Um, Let's see. Are there... Okay, I'm just going to ask as it's written. Um, sure. Are there are there any early stage trials to prevent recurrence in someone who is ER positive um, and uh, node positive that is already on a CDK four six inhibitor? Oh, that's a great question. So, patients who are on CDK four six inhibitor, this is about as escalated as we've gotten so far. I would say um, so. CDK4-6 inhibitors are super uh, effective. They were game changers in the metastatic setting. And so I was mentioning that everyone gets it first line now. It's kind of the general standard of care because these treatments work so well. And so that's why we brought them forward into the early stage setting. Now that is about as escalated as it can get. Most patients who are getting adjuvant abemacyclib, which is also known as Verzenio is the brand name. That's the only one that's FDA approved for early stage breast cancer. Almost all the patients on that clinical trial and almost all the patients that we're um, currently seeing in our clinic are patients who got chemotherapy in some form. They either needed it preoperatively to kind of downstage things, or they needed it postoperatively depending on the extent of disease or sometimes that oncotype score. So most of those patients got chemo and are now getting um, for Xenio or abemacyclib as well. So that is a lot of treatment. It's very intensive and it's very, what I would call escalated treatment. And we heard some updates at ASCO last year of how with longer follow-up in that clinical trial of patients who got um, abemacyclib, that that benefit got even 
more increased between the two treatment arms even after they had finished their two years. So even after being done with two years, at the three-year mark, at the four-year mark, there was an even greater difference actually between the arms of recurrence rates. So that was really nice to see. So having taken it for two years somehow protects you for a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. um, we are doing some clinical trials not necessarily in those patients who have gotten the CDK4-6 inhibitors to give like more therapy, for example, but we are doing some clinical trials that are related to that long-term endocrine therapy portion of treatment. There are some patients, I think many of you can, can even speak to this probably, that have a hard time tolerating endocrine therapy long-term, right? You have to get like five, seven, eight, 10 years of this, and it can cause joint pain, you know, like hot flashes, mood type symptoms. There's a lot of issues with side effects and tolerability. So we're bringing some different and new drugs into this space, a lot of which have started out in the metastatic setting. So there are this new class of drugs called oral SIRDs. There's one that's FDA approved for metastatic breast cancer. So we're testing that kind of general type of drug in patients who are having a hard time tolerating their um, endocrine therapy. And we're doing a lot of these ctDNA-based studies now. Um, there are some studies being designed and starting to enroll for what happens if you still do have some of that ctDNA. So the way these studies are working is if they're open at a certain place where you're getting your cancer treatment, they may screen a lot of patients just by sending that ctDNA test. And anyone who has detectable ctDNA becomes eligible for the clinical trial. And the clinical trial is trying to ask, if should we do the same thing we were planning to do anyway, or should we give this kind of escalated therapy? So in some patients, that's actually adding in a CDK4-6 inhibitor if they hadn't received one before. And can we kind of eradicate that ctDNA or make it go quiet again by escalating that therapy? So those are the general kinds of clinical trials that we're currently conducting. <laughs> okay, I'm going to get into some that were submitted live. I'm going to do another mixture of both here. Sure. Why was that immunotherapy study um, that you mentioned limited to ductal? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think this is um, something that a lot of us in clinic struggle with as well in general, which is that invasive lobular cancers, kind of like what you had, Megan Claire, tend to respond less to chemotherapies. They have characteristics that show that they respond less to chemotherapies and they respond better to hormonal-based therapies or endocrine therapy. So on the other hand, ductal type cancers tend to be kind of on the faster growing, more aggressive, if you will, side, and therefore tend to respond better to chemotherapy. So when these clinical trials are conducted, what we often try to do is to have a very homogeneous patient population, because otherwise, if you have too much kind of like different things or different characteristics mixed in, then it's hard to really draw conclusions. And does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's why the population of patients generally who are getting neoadjuvant chemotherapy have ductal type breast cancers. So that's why this clinical trial is selected for those patients. Oftentimes in patients with lobular cancers, chemotherapy is not necessarily that beneficial. And that goes into how we assess whether or not to give chemotherapy. It's one of the big factors in addition to other things like the Oncotype score, that sort of thing. Hmm. Okay. Uh, doo -doo -doo. What kind of testing can be done for someone who has triple negative and having a mastectomy to help prevent, you know, one day becoming metastatic. What kind of testing as okay. to? Like if you have triple negative breast cancer, and mm -hmm. honestly, I would almost even say whatever type of breast cancer you have, if you yeah. opt to say have a mastectomy, mm -hmm. does that prevent you from becoming metastatic? I think Got there's it. still I a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of uh, confusion for early stagers. Is that something we need to be worried about? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I think this is a point of confusion for a lot of patients. So in general, breast surgery and radiation, which is directed at the breast, just treats what's in the breast, right? So for a lot of patients who don't get neoadjuvant or don't get that pre surgery therapy, they go for their surgery. And then sometimes we recommend based on what they have chemotherapy or pills or whatever, right? What's even the point of doing that? If you had your entire cancer 
removed and you're like cancer free at that moment, right? That I think that's like a point of confusion for a lot of patients. Well, the point is that we know based on what subtype it is or how big it was, or just, you know, the kind of cancer it was, that there's a certain risk that cancer cells escaped that tumor. So they can escape via the lymph node system, and that can be detected when we do that axillary lymph node surgery, but they can also escape via the bloodstream. That's how recurrences happen, is when cancer cells have left the breast, right, and just the breast is treated, and then those cancer cells can percolate in the bloodstream. They can hide out from the immune system, and eventually, a couple years later, you know, one cell becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, you get the idea, it it develops into a tumor that can be seen by the eye on a PET scan, for example. So that's how a recurrence happens. So if we just treat the breast, we're not treating that micrometastatic disease, those little seeds that could have been sent out into the system. So that's why we give systemic treatment, like treatment that goes throughout the whole body, whether that's in the form of IV or pills. That's why we give these kinds of treatments post-surgery is because we make a risk assessment. There is a certain risk of having those seeds out there, which we can't really detect on modern technology, but that's what ctDNA is meant to ultimately answer. I just mentioned, you know, we're not quite there in knowing what to do with it, but the technology exists, um, which is that there's these, this micro-metastatic disease is not detectable on a PET scan. It may be detectable on ctDNA, but again, still learning what to do with that information. But that's why we give these like standard of care post-surgery treatments. Mm -hmm. Does that kind of make sense? So mm -hmm. to kind of like back up and address the actual question, there are some patients, like for example, patients who have BRCA mutations who should strongly consider getting a prophylactic mastectomy because their personal risk of developing a breast cancer is so high. Some patients also just for personal reasons choose to go through a mastectomy. Oftentimes going through a mastectomy means you don't have to get radiation. Oftentimes, there are still scenarios post mastectomy where radiation is warranted. But it's like, it's a very personal choice. If, you know, that breast is removed, then your chances of getting a breast cancer on that side are almost zero. It's not zero because it's really hard to get every single piece of breast tissue, but it's much, much, much lower, right? But that still comes to the question of that's talking about another recurrence in the breast or even in the opposite breast of a mastectomy is done there. But that still doesn't fully address the micrometastatic disease without giving IV or pill treatments, right? So getting a mastectomy can really strongly reduce the chance of a breast cancer in that breast, but it doesn't affect the overall body chance of getting stage four, like far away metastatic cancer. So there are still things that need to be done for each subtype to treat that. Does that make sense? I hope we right. explained that okay. Yeah, you know, and of course, you know, staying vig vigilant if you're feeling something or something is right, make sure that you're communicating that, you know, to your uh, medical team. Right. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Is immunotherapy given post-surgically? And is that always the case? Great question. So immunotherapy currently, as it is FDA approved, is only for triple negative early stage breast cancer. Okay, it's not FDA approved for HER2 positive breast cancer. It's not FDA approved for hormone receptor positive breast cancer. So we're really only giving it in triple negative breast cancer. And that's as part of this Keynote 522 regimen where we give four chemos, one immunotherapy. Immunotherapy starts right alongside the chemotherapy for five or so months before surgery. Mm -hmm. Then surgery happens. And then immunotherapy continues. We don't generally give IV chemo anymore post-surgery. We may still give some chemo pills, but immunotherapy keeps going to finish out one full year of immunotherapy. Okay, again, just for these triple negative breast cancers that are high risk to get this Keynote 522 regimen. There have been several studies in triple negative looking at adding in immunotherapy only post-surgery. Adding in immunotherapy does not reduce the chance of recurrence as compared to chemo alone, when it's given only post-surgery. Super interesting. And that's actually part of the data that we heard from San Antonio this year, actually. And we think the reason is that the tumor needs to be there for immunotherapy to work. That's kind of what we're learning more about. What immunotherapy is, is it's not chemo, right? Chemo is just like poison. It's not specific. It's not smart. It doesn't know where the cancer is. It just happens to work on fast growing cells, which includes cancer cells but can include other things like hair cells, bone marrow cells. So it's just nonspecific. 
immunotherapy is a little bit smarter in that the way it works is that it's um, in our regular bodies, we have breaks on the immune system. We don't want the immune system to get too excited and attack our own tissues, right? That's what autoimmune disease is, is it's the immune system being too excited and attacking the body itself. But immunotherapy stops that break. So it's like a double negative. So it actually allows the immune system to be turned on to, to attack things that are found in ourselves, which are cancer actually, right? So it was a very um, really interesting strategy, but part of the side effects of immunotherapy are autoimmune disease when the immune system gets too excited and attacks the normal tissues too, like the thyroid, for example, among many other organs um, that it can attack. So there's some thought that you need chemo and immunotherapy together, and you need to give it where the tumor is still there. Because when you give chemo, it induces this cell killing change in the tumor itself. And then you're concurrently giving that immunotherapy. And it's like, oh, wow, there's a lot of inflammation in this cancer because of the chemotherapy. That's where it is. I need to, as the immune system, come and find it and help kill it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But then in the post-surgery setting, there's no more Chemo, there's no more, sorry, there's no more tumor there. So we think that when we give immunotherapy purely starting at the time of surgery and afterward where there's no tumor anymore, it just doesn't really seem to decrease that recurrence risk, probably because the immune system doesn't really know what it's looking for or mm. what to do. So it does seem like when immunotherapy is given, it has to be given in that pre-surgery setting alongside chemotherapy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can, can you um, clarify, is Herceptin an immunotherapy? Oh, good question. We generally consider Herceptin, or also known as Trastuzumab, as kind of like a targeted therapy. It's immunotherapy, the way we use the term, is specifically to this class of drugs called checkpoint inhibitors. So that's like Pembrolizumab, Nivolumab. There's some other um, drugs like Ipilimumab, Dervalumab that are in that category. Um in a way, anti-HER2 therapy is kind of similar to immunotherapies. It's not a chemo. It's not that kind of like poison drug, but it's a targeted therapy that goes to the HER2 receptor and acts on it. Um, so we put that in the category of like anti-HER2 treatments, not necessarily the kind of immunotherapy that I'm talking about. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. When are MRIs important as supplemental scans in dense breast with a history of invasive lobular breast cancer. Yeah, sure. This kind of gets to post um, treatment imaging in general, which I see that someone else asked about. I think that in in many of my interactions with patients, um, I often hear about like discomfort with the frequency of monitoring post-surgically. Mm -hmm. In a lot of patients, we just do their yearly mammograms. If the radiologist feels that a supplemental ultrasound is helpful alongside that mammogram, we do that. There are certain patients who have a baseline high enough risk of personal breast cancer that we add in MRI screening that may be based on density of breast, that may be based on their genetic um, risk as well, if they have like a genetic mutation identified. So it, it that is also very patient specific. It's not necessarily like a blanket recommendation across patients with invasive lobular cancer, for example. Um, and when we do MRIs, we often do it like six months off from the um, mammogram and or ultrasound such that someone's getting imaging every six months, even though each type of imaging is a yearly imaging. But most people don't get MRIs. It's really kind of specific to um, personal breast cancer risk and density of breast seen on imaging. And our radiologists can help guide us on when that's an important part of screening. And I think someone else asked about PET scans afterward as well. So mm -hmm. breast imaging is generally yearly. When MRI is added in, that's still yearly, but we often do that at the six-month interval such that someone's getting every six-month imaging. PET scans are not standard of care as regular surveillance after breast cancer. First of all, for patients with low um, risk, meaning like an, a stage one breast cancer, certain stage two breast cancers without any lymph nodes, we don't get PET scans at all. That's because the risk of, or the chances of detecting something far away when the tumor is so small or so low risk is very, very low. But the chances of detecting something like a false positive that we then go chase after with an invasive biopsy, which is 
not benign, can cause um, side effects, even be life-threatening in certain cases, like um, a liver biopsy, for example, if that resulted in bleeding, or a lung biopsy, if that resulted in a puncture of the regular lung. So we don't do PET scans in those cases because it's a benefit to risk kind of weighing that we're doing there, um, if that makes any sense. And PET scans are not routine part of care either. We've actually found that even when um, doing PET scans regularly mm -hmm. on a clinical trial, for example, um, detecting cancer early in a recurrence form, I mean, like a stage four cancer early when the patient has no symptoms, no abnormal blood tests, nothing like that, it results in giving them treatment for longer because we caught them earlier, but it doesn't actually improve their long-term survival. And that's probably because if we catch them at the time that they have symptoms or have blood tests that are abnormal and start treatment then, it's still effective and we're still treating it at that point. Mm -hmm. But people just end up on treatment longer with more therapy toxicity instead. So PET scans are not a standard part of our long-term screening or follow-up post breast cancer diagnosis. This is where ctDNA is going to be helpful. We're just not ready for it yet. Like in the ideal setting, we would understand the best time to send a ctDNA and the patients who have detectable ctDNA, we, we escalate their therapy in some way. Kind of like the way we use pathologic complete response, right? That I talked about. In those patients in whom we didn't get everything, we do something different. We escalate their therapy. Eventually, we will have the clinical trial data to guide us. Like, let's say, you know, someone's been taking their hormonal therapies and they're at the end of their prescribed eight year duration, right? Eventually, it'd be nice to have the studies to guide us on, like, let's send a ctDNA at eight years when they're finishing up their therapy. Oh, people who are positive we actually need to not only continue it, but give them this additional treatment to kind of try to make it negative again. Oh, but you're negative. You're good. You're all set. You're done with your eight years. Like, congratulations, right? Like, that would be the ideal scenario. But that's not where we are in terms of our research. What we just know is that detecting it is probably bad. But even when we don't detect it, some of those patients are still going to recur. And that when we do detect it, we just don't know what to do with it. And when is the right time to test? So there's still a lot going on in this field, but it's a field of rapid expansion, a lot of interest, a lot of different ctDNA companies um, working on like refining their specific assays and getting really good at detecting that cancer at a very, very, very low threshold. Um, so this is something that I think over the next five to 10 years is going to totally change our field and the way we practice, um, but we're still in early stages. Right. It's like all of us are like, we want the answer now. No, I know. I know the fear I is, is always like there. And then yeah. we have that anxiety yeah. for those of us that still get those, you know. Right. Oh. That's what I think CTDNA right now is. It's just yeah. like knowledge and anxiety yes. without action. And I'm not sure that's beneficial. In fact, I think it can oftentimes just be harmful, like psychiatrically, mm -hmm. kind of knowing that information or having that information hanging over you. Yeah. So. Uh, well, my goodness, uh, we, we were getting a ton of questions. So um, do you, would it be all right, Dr. Shen, if I sent you um, some of these questions that came in live that we weren't able to get to, sure. maybe we can do like a, another, you know, pre-recorded type of thing where we can get some answers to these because they are important. And I, I really want to, you know, make sure everyone fully understands uh, the science. Yeah. Happy to, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Well, everyone, I want to thank all of you for being here today. Excellent questions and engagement. And again, Dr. Sherry Shen, you are amazing and love the way you really break things down in a, um, in a patient friendly way um, to the fact that we were just, you know, inundated with more questions. So everyone look for this recording. It will come out, um, you know, in a few weeks, and then we will have like another follow-up to answer some of these questions that I'll get with Dr. Sherry Shen. And we'll communicate when that recording will be ready. Um, everyone make sure to check out Sherry's website for upcoming educational 
programs, podcast episodes, and support groups. Don't forget to follow us on social media as well. And also, as soon as this webinar is over, please take a moment to fill out our survey. Um, this survey will pop up in your browser um, once we end it, and the link will also be sent in a follow-up email. But all surveys are anonymous, and we do read those um, to prepare for future programming. And again, this concludes the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Shen, and thank you so much for everyone attending today. Of course. Thank you all for having me.